Welcome to this online worship service at Church Street United Methodist Church. My name is John Eldridge and I am serving as your liturgist today. Let us prepare our hearts and minds as we worship. Please join me in our unison call to worship. We gather together in your presence, O God, Lord of heaven and earth. We know you as the creator of the world and everything in it, the one who gave us life and breath, the one who is never far away from us, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. We come this day to praise and worship our living God. Our Psalter lesson today is Psalm 62, verses 5 through 12. For God alone my soul waits in silence. For my hope is from God, who alone is my rock and my salvation. My fortress I shall not be shaken. On God rest my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in God at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before God, who is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in exhortation, no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, power belongs to God. To you and to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you repay all according to their work. Thank you. 
you join me now in our prayer for illumination? Holy God, your voice comes to us in thunderbolt and lightning. It also comes in the silence of your holy breath. By the power of the Holy Spirit, speak to us today in ways that draw us closer to you, and particularly in these words of scripture we ponder at this hour. Amen. Our scripture today comes from Acts 20, verses 1 through 3 and 7 through 12. After the uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them and saying farewell, he left for Macedonia. When he had gone through these regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece, where he stayed for three months. He was about to set sail for Syria when a plot was made against him by the Jews, so he decided to return through Macedonia. On the first day of the week when we met to break bread, Paul was holding a discussion with them. Since he intended to leave the next day, he continued speaking until midnight. There were many lamps in the room upstairs where we were meeting. A young man named Eutychus, who was sitting in the window, began to sink off into a deep sleep while Paul talked still longer. Overcome by sleep, he fell to the ground three floors below and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and bending over him, took him in his arms and said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. Then Paul went upstairs, and when he had broken bread and eaten, he continued to converse with them until dawn. Then he left. Meanwhile, they had taken the boy away alive and were not a little comfort. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Amen. Each time I hear the text for today, I'm reminded of the farmer who went to church one Sunday to hear the new preacher just arrive from the city, and he decided that he would take old Bob, his hound dog, with him. Throughout the lengthy sermon, the dog made those little whining noises that dogs make when they sleep, and then he even snored out loud a few times. After the service, as the farmer went to, through the door to greet the pastor, the pastor turned on him and snarled, Don't you ever bring that dog to church again. Don't worry, answered the farmer. I wouldn't put him through it. Evidently, the sermon seemed interminable, not only to the farmer, but to the dog. Or could it have been that the farmer and the congregation that morning were spiritually asleep? That brings us to today's account of the youth who was sitting in the cramped quarters well past his bedtime. He became so drowsy he put himself in grave danger. Now scripture tells of other happenings when people fell asleep. When Adam fell asleep, remember he woke up missing a rib and found a strange woman beside him. 
And then when Samson awoke from a nap, he discovered he was bald and he had been beaten. And when Jonah was dozing during a sailing trip, he was thrown overboard and swallowed by a big fish. But Eutychus, the youth, is the only biblical figure who is remembered for falling asleep during a sermon. But who among us hasn't become drowsy during a lecture or some time in worship? We go to sleep sometimes at the wrong time, in the wrong place. How foolish I was to sign up for an economics class right after, after lunch when I was in undergraduate school. It was all I could do to, to keep from being in a stupor that whole semester. In late afternoon, uh, once a student beside me was lethargic and he dozed off and hit his head with a loud bang on the desk and that woke me up too. Kind Dr. Elrell did not say a word. He only went on with his sermon or with his lecture that day. I survived that semester only because I drank a lot of coffee and by the grace of God. Now speech specialists tell us that about a third of us suffer from uh, sleep uh, problems and we are liable to drop off at any moment. And so when people are uh, drowsy, when I see them nodding off during a sermon, it really doesn't bother me because after all, I don't really know what's going on in their lives. They may have been waiting up all night on a teenager out with a family car, or they may be taking uh, some sort of uh, medication that makes them drowsy. At the breakfast table downstairs after Easter sunrise service a few weeks ago, I witnessed a little girl and she climbed up on her dad's lap at the table next to ours. She put her face close to his ear and she whispered, Daddy, can we go home now? I'm sleepy. No, sweetheart, he told her. We can't go yet. We have one more service and then we'll go home. She put her head back down on his shoulder and was so weary that day. Maybe Eutychus with drooping eyelids could, who could have been anywhere, scripture tells us, or historians tell us, he could have been between 8 and 14 years old. He, maybe he also turned and asked his father the same thing. How much longer, Dad? I'm sleepy. The reply came, I know it's late, son, but it's imperative that we stay in a little while. We'll be leaving. We can picture the youth with his shoulders stooped, his head down. He's slowly making his way over to the window ledge to catch a breeze and hope against hope he can stay awake. He knew the words being spoken were very important that night, and for a while he listened, but then he began to fade away. Now, it wasn't that the adolescent Eutychus was not accustomed to worshiping at night. He was, because most of the congregants in this church in Troas were slaves, and that included the children. They would have labored all day long. Night was the only time they could gather together to worship. And so at this point, about the year 58, believers were meeting on Sunday evenings, the day of Jesus' resurrection. Historians tell us further that the congregation probably would have shared a meal about 6 o'clock, and then at 7 o'clock they would have begun to worship. There would have been hymns and prayers and readings from the Hebrew Bible, and perhaps they would share portions of a letter from the missionary. But this night in particular was very unusual. The esteemed preacher Paul was in town, and the crowd longed to hear everything he had to say. Luke's portrait of Jesus in his gospel features an urgency in his message. And here in Acts, we also feel that immediacy in Paul's mission. He is headed to Jerusalem, we find out, to deliver funds for the famine relieved that is very dangerous there. The apostle has already had premonitions of his own arrest and his death. And he knows that a group of Jews are plotting to kill him. They are on his heels, and Paul wants to make the best use of his time that he has in Troas, and he has to leave at daybreak. So picture, if you will, the atmosphere that evening. 
The congregation is anxious for Paul. His enemies may be pouncing at any moment, and they may hear heavy footsteps on the stairs leading to the upstairs. The lamps are dim, and the sermon is offered in a hushed tone. And here, in this very stuffy room, with limited space, the air is thick with the odor of the oil from the burning lamps. This is when Eutychus succumbs. A dull thud is heard from outside. Someone jumps up and notices that Eutychus is no longer in the window. Then they peer into the shadows and they see a motionless body there in the garden below. Aghast, the worshippers spring from their cushions and rush down three flights of stairs. They are horrified to find the body of this innocent boy. Some think Luke, the physician, was also there. Maybe he has already felt the boy's pulse and seen the gash on his head. Maybe he's turned to the parents and told them, there's nothing I can do. He's gone. But then Paul steps forward and he calms the commotion. He then kneels down and gently picks up the lifeless body and he holds the boy close to his chest. Do not despair. He says, the boy is alive. The boy is alive. Praises indeed. The boy's dark eyes open wide and he stares, maybe wondering why all these people are gathered around. They are elated. Certainly, this is enough excitement for one evening. But rather than calling in a night, they turn and return to the upstairs, upstairs alcove. And Paul continues to talk to the people until his departure at dawn. Now our hearts go out to the boy Eutychus because such an innocent mistake, it could happen to any of us. It could have been uh, anyone in the crowd that night. But Luke found it so important that he put quill to parchment and he recorded this event in detail. The story spread fast to other churches in the region, and these other hearers would not have been so lenient, however, with Eutychus. One Lutheran scholar has written that the other communities would have immediately made an important connection upon hearing this story about the youth. They would have remembered another upper room where believers were gathered years earlier. They would have visualized Jesus in that upper room, speaking intimately with his disciples. There they had broken bread and prayed, and they had listened intently as the teacher had spoken to them, the ones whom he had grown to love. And they would have also recalled that there was one present at that table who was not really listening. He wasn't paying attention. Maybe he was thinking about all the money he was going to soon receive. He wasn't really paying attention. Yes, that upper room was a dangerous place where Jesus was because that was where Ju Judas himself fall fell away. Maybe that was the danger that Paul was warning against in his final homily that night to the Troas congregation. Amid all the harsh challenges faced by these Troas followers, there would have been every tem temptation to go, to go the other way. But it's unlikely Paul wasn't just preaching. He was taking questions, and he was offering advice about the importance of holding on to the faith. He was retelling the story of the resurrection and how having the power of Christ in their lives would help them endure every calamity. Just prior to his arrival in Troas, Paul had penned a letter to another fledgling congregation, and in it he wrote, You know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Darkness and light, awake and asleep. Paul used those same marvelous metaphors that Jesus used when he taught. It is spiritual sleepiness that is to be guarded against. 
In our culture, so many of us today live in a routine induced days. At home or at church, it seems we're always focused on our personal problems, what's going on in the world, and all the pressures that we have. And yes, we're focused with the grave situations that face our nation and our world and our own community. But if we aren't careful, we will end up living in a fog that rarely lifts, never attending to what is of ultimate importance. God speaks to us in as much more often, I think, than we ever choose to realize. His voice is written out for us in the everyday humdrum events of our lives. Who knows what he will say to me or to you today, or in the midst of what unlikely circumstance? Often the word he says is, press on, or keep the faith, or trust me. Now Luke doesn't always include the names of those whom he encounter, encounters in his travels with Paul. But he does so when the person goes on to do something important. So we might wonder what Eutychus did that was so important, so worthy of note. That tumble in the dark surely made an impression on Eutychus, for he learned that he had nothing to fear from death. And remembering that he couldn't keep his literal, eye, literal eyes open all the time, he began keeping open the eyes of his heart. And as he matured, maybe he was always on the lookout for moments to care, for times when he could assist someone else who was struggling. Maybe he began to notice where God was already at work, and he centered himself around those priorities. And perhaps along the way, he began to share Jesus' words that he had learned from the itinerant pastors who passed through town. Kathleen Norris has fashioned some of Jesus' words in a beautiful way. She calls them imperatives. She's listed them in a, in a very simple poem that she entitled by that word, imperatives. It goes, look at the birds, consider the lilies, ask, seek, knock, enter by the narrow gate, judge not, go, let it be done for you. Do not be afraid. Stretch out your hand. Maiden, I say, arise. Young man, I say, arise. Be still. Love, forgive, remember me. My little neighbor boy, not quite eight, came to my kitchen to retrieve a popsicle one hot day. He glanced up at my mantle and he noticed a copy of that poem that I had had framed. I took it down and we read it together as he enjoyed his popsicle. Afterwards, he exclaimed, I know those words, they're from the Bible. Yes, a loving father and mother had taken him to church regularly. Now I'm sure he does his share of snoozing in the pew with his parents, but he also listens, doesn't he? How fortunate. By the way, did you know that the name Eutychus means fortunate? Eutychus falling became a glorious illustration of Paul's message because it's a story of second chances. By the power of Jesus Christ, the dead are raised, and through the grace of Jesus, our own failures and our inattention and our spiritual sleepiness are forgiven and healed. For when we fall, God's grace raises us back up again and again and again and again. How fortunate we are. Amen. Will you join me now in our affirmation of faith which comes from 1 Timothy? There is one God and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all, to whom we testify. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Jesus came into the world to save sinners and was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel.
for the church, the world, and all who are in need. We give you thanks for the community of faith throughout the world, according to your compassion, holy God. Guide your church to proclaim the gospel so that its wide open door is apparent to everyone. Heal the great chasms that exist between our peoples. Help our leaders and teachers to shepherd us with wisdom. We give you thanks, O oh God, for nations and leaders. By your power, inspire all people to insist on just economies and social structures. Prepare our young people to turn their zeal into peace. Combine those who are discouraged and teach us all to persevere. We give you thanks for all creation. Open our eyes and ears to see and know more about this earthly home, which you have created for your joy and ours. Show us how to love the creatures and plants we would otherwise ignore and neglect. Merciful Lord, we pray for those among your people here and throughout the world who are in trouble, the sick and the hungry, those who are unjustly imprisoned and abused, children without shelter, adults without work. Hear our cries, O Lord, for the children and adults for whom school is no longer a place of safety. Bring comfort to families who are experiencing their worst nightmares and lift the voices who can no longer just pray as we wail, how long, O oh Lord. Ascended Lord, we trust that you will hear our prayers and answer with what we need. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all, as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will you receive the blessing? May you breathe the breath of the Father. May you feel Christ the Son in your flesh. And may the wings of the Spirit knit us all together as we go forth in peace to love and to serve our Lord. Amen.